Well, this is uh, a presentation called, as you can see, The Effect of the Scientific Revolution on Philosophy. Most of what you have been considering up to this point have been causes of and descriptions of the scientific revolution. My presentation, I think Mr. Palvin's as well, if I'm not mistaken, is looking more at what happened as a result, what were the effects of the scientific revolution, and so I'm looking more or less after the fact. I don't want you to misunderstand, so let me tell you up front that while I am a fan of the scientific revolution, I think it's one of God's great gifts to us in terms of our Western heritage and so on, I am not so much of a fan of the effects, and so this may strike you as a presentation which has a little bit of a negative uh, slant to it, because I think that while, as Paul says, we should use this world, we should be on our guard not to abuse this world, the statement he makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I think the scientific revolution certainly used this world rightly. I think, however, that maybe some of what took place afterwards became an abuse of this world, and so I will be kind of chasing that idea along. And also, uh, right up front, apologize to my philosophy students, some of whom are sitting here looking very, very impressive, but, uh, because this is all going to be absolutely pure, unmitigated review, repetition. So feel free to snore. It's okay. You can just kind of pass out. Uh, there we are. But uh, anyway. So those of you who will be taking philosophy from me someday, you'll cover some of this material in some greater detail than we're going to have right now. Let's, uh, let's pray and get started. Father, we're grateful to you for your many mercies to us. We thank you for the wonderful opportunities we've had to learn from this History Emphasis Week and thinking about the scientific revolution. We pray that our time together right now would be guided through your spirit, so that we would have clarity and understanding, and all of these things would be to the glory of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, well, 100 years ago, when I went to college, I wanted to be a psychology major. And the reason for that was because I was interested in human beings. Even in high school, I'd sort of thought about, why do people do things? How come people are more, some people are more emotional than others? And how come some people seem to have more problems? And I, I actually had designs at the time of possibly becoming a counselor or a psychologist. And so I thought, well, what better way to get myself down the road toward that objective than to major in psychology? And so off I went. And after bouncing around a couple of other majors, wound out as a declared psych major. I was somewhat disappointed when early on in my studies of psychology, I found out that the prevailing paradigm for psychological theory at the time was more or less the result of the architecture of a guy by the name of B.F. Skinner, who was pictured here. Skinner was a professor of psychology at Harvard University. He was very highly respected. At the time, he's not so much in vogue these days, but nevertheless at the time, he was kind of a popular guy. And most of my psychological studies in college were oriented to a so-called Skinnerian approach. Skinner himself was connected to something called radical behaviorism. The heart of his paradigm for psychological understanding came to be called the Skinner Box, which I have now set before you. The Skinner box has a particular set of little apparatuses that are connected to it. And I'll just kind of mention these here briefly. You can see it there. There's a speaker, which gives certain sounds to this mouse. There are signal lights, red and blue. There's a little lever that the mouse would push. And upon pushing it, a food dispenser would send a little pellet of food down a tube into the box to reward whatever the behavior was of the mouse that the, the uh, experimenter was trying to reward. But you'll also notice more sinister aspects to this because there is an electric grid you see at the bottom. And then off on the uh, side is what's called a shock generator. I've actually been pr proposing that here at the Oaks we might want to start implementing some of these uh, as a new disciplinary, a kind of a shock generator beneath each chair in the room, you know? And so when a child begins to disobey a little bit, kind of acting up over here, I just beep, and you know, I got a little, you know, 100 volts or so, bang like that. You get great behavior, right? I, I'm, I'm rethinking my criticism of Skinner. But anyway, Skinner uh, was developing a hypothesis that 
A rat could be trained to a very sophisticated level of behavior. I mean, he could train these rats to roll over three times, count to ten, do calculus, and so on, all of which was to get a food pellet. It was really quite an astonishing thing. Little flashing lights and a certain sequence and so on, the, 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 the rats could learn all of this and became quite impressive in their ability to evaluate their, their uh, environment and do certain things as a result of it. And Skinner's belief was all of that was the product of what he called conditioning. We called it operant conditioning, in which certain behaviors would be rewarded systematically, others would be extinguished, and by virtue of kind of manipulating the environment using all these little devices, he could get uh, creatures to behave in a certain way. Well, he extrapolated from that that all of us are really simply sophisticated rats in much more sophisticated Skinner boxes. And the reason that any of you are sitting here in this room right now listening to this lecture, the reason that you behave the way you do, the reason that you act in any way that you do is strictly the product of the conditioning that has taken place in which certain of your behaviors have been rewarded and certain of them have been extinguished or punished over time and that you are therefore simply the net result of your conditioning. That there's nothing else that accounts for what you are than those forces that he called inputs that have produced the output of your behavior right now. At the time, I didn't find that that training and learning how to train a mouse was all, all, all that helpful, but uh, actually I used it quite a bit when I was uh, raising my kids. I found that it was quite effective. You know, so. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, it's the uh, most famous book that was written by B.F. Skinner it was quite a sensation at the time. It was entitled Beyond Freedom and Dignity because, according to Skinner, those are nonsense terms. It is nonsensical to speak of human freedom. You are the net product of your conditioning. There's no freedom to it. Freedom implies some kind of choice you make wherein, as a matter of fact, you make no choices. You are simply programmed by those environmental factors that have produced you. But of course, if you have no freedom, then terms like dignity also begin to be fairly uh, meaningless terms. And all of this, of course, stood for a great idea of science more or less taking over entirely an understanding of what it is to be human. This is what I say, what I mean when I say uh, use this world but don't abuse it. In my view, this is an abuse of science, making it explain more than it's capable or competent to explain, and by so doing, ridding you of any idea of value, any idea of right and wrong, ethical truth, transcendent uh, value of any kind, and reducing you really just simply to a rat, you see. And that was really what was going on, and in some ways still going on in certain schools of uh, psychological thought. Well, this was inspired. In other words, B.F. Skinner didn't come up with this all on his own. He read a book, and the book was written earlier in this century by a guy named John Watson. And the man's name, or the name of the book that he wrote was Behaviorism. John Watson himself had been inspired to do his writing by reading the uh, production of a guy by the name of John Dewey. Now, John Dewey's name you may recognize because John Dewey in some ways is regarded as the inventor of modern educational theory. We don't use his theories very much here at the Oaks, but most of the educational enterprise going on in America today is carried on in light of the uh, principles that were set forth by John Dewey, who was a signatory to the Humanist Manifesto. He was an atheist, he was an evolutionist, and he was committed to a certain way of doing education that really gave rise to this whole behavioristic understanding. He, Dewey, was generally, he acknowledged many times, influenced by the philosopher Georg, sometimes pronounced George, Hegel. And George Hegel gave us what's called a dialectical approach to philosophy and to education. And so that's kind of the chain that connects Skinner back into philosophical ideas. And so I'd like to have you think about Hegel as kind of, sort of a centerpiece of our discussion right now. But really to get to Hegel, we need to go to an earlier time. This is Hegel. And Hegel gave us this dialectical approach he was attempting to fundamentally change the way in which we do philosophy, and he was consciously trying to marry science with philosophy. He comes right after the Enlightenment, and he's attempting in some ways 
to bring what he thought were the great advances of the Enlightenment into a philosophical system and produce then what has subsequently become modern philosophy. Well, how do you do that? Oh, I'm glad you asked. So, the uh, philosophy and the scientific revolution. In order to really understand it, we need to go, great, go way back to what I'm calling the grand distinction of classic philosophy. And the best way to symbolize this is to simply put a horizontal line on the screen. This is not a timeline. This isn't the line that you saw with Mr. Dowers a couple of days ago. It's rather a distinction between two levels of truth or two levels of human knowledge. One level could be called physical reality. It could be called the, the uh, level of nature or the level of what is. So this is what we commonly think of as the interest area of science. Now, on the other hand, above this line, you have what is commonly called, traditionally called, metaphysical reality. Aristotle himself is the one that coined that term, and he simply meant those things that are beyond the physical world. There is a level of truth, he thought, that is not immediately recognizable or discernible by simple, you know, human uh, natural observation. But this would be the level of things like supernature and the question about what is... Uh, what ought to be. So I could say on the one hand, here you are in this room, that is what is. Then I could raise the question, is this what ought to be? Should you be in this room? It's a very different question, isn't it? Let's see. It's one thing to note you are here, it's another thing to pass judgment on the significance of you being here in terms of the category of ought. Ought you be here, you see. One appeals to this level of physical observation, the other appeals to a higher level that kind of stands in judgment, in some sense, over the physical level. To use terms that you may be familiar with as well, you'd have terms like, this is just the good, the true, and the beautiful. These would all be ideas that are above the line, that are not necessarily things that you would simply derive from an observation of reality itself or the natural order. All right, so this great debate of classic philosophy is symbolized by two characters. All right, this is the first answer. This is uh, the upward path that would be found in Plato. This is from Raphael's famous painting of the Academy, and of course his little cameo of Plato, of Plato here shows the one finger pointing up, right? And that finger pointing up is supposed to stand for Plato's notion that the way that we discover this world of metaphysical truth is what could be called the upward path, or the world of pure reason, of simply exercising the mind and so on. And then we have answer number two. There we are. And this is uh, Aristotle. So Aristotle, you notice the difference between these two guys. You have Plato, who has his finger pointing up, standing for a notion that the way we discover this level above the line, the way we discover it, is by a sort of rational or intuitive inward path. The way Aristotle thought we discovered it was more an empirical or natural or scientific path, and thus he has four fingers pointing out, meaning pointing out to the world as a place that we should explore. Both of them said that we can, by this means, discover uh, the metaphysical level. They both believed in it. They just had differences of opinion as to how we were best to go about exploring it. Alright, so these are the great debaters of uh, classic philosophy. This is Plato and Aristotle. This is a little kind of uh, vignette, as you know, from Raphael's Academy. And, uh, so Plato's rationalism stands for the pursuit of truth follows this path of pure reason and intuition. Aristotle's path, there we are, follows a path of science and observation. So you've got that before you. And taken together, these two represent sort of this great, uh, in some ways, the very kind of uh, framework for philosophical thought from that point on. 